This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Patrick McMahon is the Director of Renovations and Gallery Displays at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. Uh, originally a member of the Art of the Americas Department, he joined the Exhibitions Department in 2006 and continues to support numismatic inquiries for the American co uh, collections. An associate member of the American Numismatic Society, McMahon is an active collaborator on ANS projects related to medallic art and the work of Victor David Brenner. These include the Brenner 150 exhibition, a digital recreation of the famous 1912 Hello exhibition of Brenner's work. Uh, and Brenner has also, I'm sorry, and Patrick has also been very instrumental in uh, the year and a half long, almost two year long conversation uh, that we've been having during the, uh, the planning of all of this. Uh, we've had pretty much daily uh, email chains, conversations going back and forth. And, uh, and even though uh, Patrick is uh, presenting via Zoom right now, he is actually a, a very key and instrumental part of this COAC. So please uh, welcome Patrick McMahon. Thank you. Um, I, first, I want to start, um, since you guys can't hear me clapping uh, at home, I want to start by saying the presentation so far have been uh, really, really exciting. Um, and it's interesting to me how they sort of build on each other and kind of dovetail. So far, we're all sort of doing something very similar, which is trying to discover some mysterious aspect of a relationship Brenner has that's relative to specific works that he did. Um, that's certainly what I'm trying to do. Um, and I, I, I really, I think, I don't know if it's deliberate or not, but it's great coming after Peter because I'm uh, almost all the names he mentioned are going to come up uh, in my presentation, and um, it's a uh, it's a it's a tight circle I think that that Brenner's patrons within the ANS actually have. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, you see that? Yes, sir. All right. So not much has been written about Victor David Brenner's society, the Cincinnati Medal. And I, and I think it's because um, there are so few examples and the origin of it is, is not known. Um, but many of Brenner's associates and colleagues were members of heritage, historical, or patriotic societies who were participating in the creation of a colonial revival history that was in many ways a reaction to the contemporary influx of immigrants that included Brenner himself. Uh, and in the 1890s, the creation and expansion of these societies uh, really boomed, and uh, it afforded Brenner and his peers many opportunities for medallic commissions. An artistic transmission of these values started generations beforehand, making this work part of the history you know, that his clients wanted to project. Uh, viewed in this context, it's easier to understand how this medal fits into Brenner's catalog of work, because quite honestly, it's just the, the least Brenner-like medal I think he, he ever did. Um, and here it is. So this is the Society uh, of the Cincinnati, uh, two of their emblems. Um, and you know he donated it exhibited auctioned examples of this during his lifetime, but it remains unexplained. And it was even unknown to Erskine Hume uh, while he was preparing his catalog of the Cincinnati medals for the numismatist in 1934. Uh, Henry Russell Drown, secretary of the American Numismatic Society and himself a marshal of the Cincinnati, uh, told Hume about it and his belief that, the, that Brenner had done it. Um, the medal was then 35 or 40 years old and it remains unclear why Brenner created it. Um, and, and, but I think that the question of why he created it obscures the more interesting question of, of how did he create it. Uh, because this is not an original design, uh, Brenner needed a source for it, and it's always said that it is a copy after Pierre L'Enfant's original design for a society medal from 1783, uh, a medal that was never realized. Uh, this is undeniably the source for the design Brenner copies, but the fidelity is not exact. 
Uh, and Brenner was a careful copyist when he engraved his dyes, and there, there, there are enough differences to suggest that there were intermediate sources. So you know, what exactly did Brenner have access to when he created this? What drawings, engravings, photographs were available in, in the 1890s uh, that, you know, to transmit this design? And, and who might he have known uh, that could have given him access to them? So trying to reconstruct ways that Brenner may have been able to create a particular work draws attention to individuals. Uh, who may very well have commissioned it. And it can also help explain how or why these details uh, of its history may have been lost. Oops, I'm gonna go back. Sorry about that. Anyway, so this is Len Font's design. Um, the, the, the Society of Cincinnati was formed by Henry Knox and a group of officers from Washington's army. Uh, the Society of Cincinnati had an important role to play in the transition from wartime to peacetime. Uh, almost two years after the decisive battle of Yorktown, the army had yet to be disbanded or paid uh, by Congress, and there was a dangerous stirring of dissent. Uh, so it was a major goal of Washington's to see Congress do right by the army and also so that, uh, you know, so peace could occur, occur before some kind of rebellion uh, would break out. And there was very serious signs of dissent among the army. Um, so he spent much of 1783 holding the army together and lobbying Congress. Uh, and in this moment, he, he's not the Cincinnati as he's sort of talked about today. Uh, he's, he's one of them. Uh, each officer is being asked to follow the example of Cincinnati and lay down their arms peacefully. Uh, and so a properly organized society of the Cincinnati, you know, may help them uh, stay in touch after they're disbanded through the society chapters in different states and uh, give them some political clout with Congress after they've all gone home. Uh, and so politically, this was a, a, an advantageous uh, move um, on, a, on a more sort of hearts and minds of the people move. Their decision to make it a heritage society was not. And that, that sort of drove a lot of suspicion that they were actually trying to create a, an American aristocracy because, you know, th this is a... a very important transitional moment for the country. And it's really not clear what's going to happen. Um, so when L'Enfant does this design, uh, the Cincinnati are forming um, and the, 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 the details that he uses when he uh, comes up with the devices it, are very important. Um, and so consistent with the moment, he's choosing the format of a piece metal uh, and he's trained in Paris uh, as an artist. His father was painter for the king who specialized in military battles. Um, and he, so he has an academic background there um, and he seems to be familiar with an iconography that goes back centuries and he weaves it neatly into the narrative uh, scenes of Cincinnatus's life. Uh, on, the, on the obverse, what you see uh, to the left, that's Cincinnatus being called by the senators of Rome to assume the powers of a dictator and go uh, save the people. And you can see the, the battles going on in the background there. And then uh, on the reverse, he's uh, quickly achieved victory and he drops his weapons and surrenders the power of dictatorship and returns peacefully to his plow. Uh, so that's the sort of myth of Cincinnati that, that is being used here. And when you compare it to a 17th century medal, uh, uh, this one by Sebastian Dodler, you can see how, how carefully he did uh, sort of uh, think this through. This one is from 1629, it's the Thirty Years' War, and that's the city of Nuremberg. And if you look at the left side, I'm sorry, it's a little grainy. Uh, you can see a soldier, a person falling over backwards, someone running away, the city's on fire, uh, pretty much exactly what's going on to the left of the, the vignette of Cincinnati there on the obverse of, of L'Enfant's design. Uh, and then on the reverse of the, uh, of L'Enfant's design, which is the scene to the right of the praying figure in the dollar medal. You have, you know, sun shining on a peaceful city. Uh, you have a farmer returning to his plow over a body of water. In this case, the, the farmer is Cincinnati. And then on the reverse, you have this device with hands clasping below a heart. Uh, and you can see that that's down in the exergue of, of L'Enfant's own medal. So comparing Brenner's medal to L'Enfant's design, you can see that there's definitely something changed in between. So if you look 
for this obverse, uh, Brenner's changed the dimensions of the cabin a little bit, but otherwise it's pretty much the same. Uh, he's added another row of tips to the logs uh, along the edge here. Um, they're just suggested there, um, but we're missing the farm equipment and things like that. Um, and then if you look at the reverse, um, there's even more that's changed. Cincinnatus is walking in a different direction, the, the shield, um, and he doesn't seem to be aware that this heart down here uh, should be held in a pair of clasped hands. It's just sort of sitting on a, uh, on a curve. So Linfont's designs for the Cincinnati Medal were approved, but it was never executed. And the parchments never left the society's archives. When he goes to Paris to make arrangements for the engraving of the diploma, which is their certificate of membership, uh, the fabrication of the orders, uh, which is their badges, the eagles that they wear, um, uh, his metal design remains behind, or he has a different version of it uh, or something. Uh, but in Paris, he commissions the artist uh, Augustin Louis Labelle uh, to convert this watercolor, uh, which is on the screen, uh, sketched into uh, uh, a drawing um, so that it can then be engraved. And then, and then he hires um, Jean-Jacques André Laveau to engrave the plate um, without any uh, text. They're not doing the text in Paris. It hasn't been approved yet. Um, and uh, this is the final version of the diploma after it's fully finished. They're all signed by Henry Knox as the secretary and George Washington as the president. Um, and you can see that a soldier on the left stands beside a vignette based on the obverse of the medal. And he's trampling a British flag and there's a sort of eagle uh, blasting Britannia's lion, which doesn't look like a lion, it's kind of cool. Um, and she's sort of losing her crown as she's running for the boats. Uh, you know, that's this sort of fleet leaving uh, the withdrawal of British power from, from North America or from, from, the, from America. Uh, and then on the right, you see uh, there's the heraldic angel carrying a vignette uh, from, from the reverse of the, of the medal. And so the French artists are the ones who make the first big change. Um, and this is, I'll show you the full plate in a minute. This, these are details from the only known surviving print of the plate that was uh, as it existed uh, in Paris before it was re-engraved re with the text in Philadelphia. So you can see the texts are missing from the, the devices, but you can also see this is where the shield comes from, the reversal of his walk. Uh, the plow is totally abstracted at, at this point. And then you can also see there's no more, there are no hands uh, with the heart. Uh, and then, uh, you know, on the other side, again, uh, it's, it's not as, there, there, there are very fewer changes on the, on the obverse than there are on the reverse, but there's quite a few. They simplified the tree stump, they've changed the boats, simplified the city, uh, you get the idea. So this, these are the first most significant changes. Um, and here's a print, and this was done on paper, not parchment. Uh, it says Amérique on the uh, margin, and it has a French, uh, the paper itself has a French watermark. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for uh, Ellen Clark, who's the um, library director at the Society of Cincinnati for telling me about this. Um, uh, she said it's the only one they know that exists it's at, and it's at Winter Tour. And here you can see, you know, the, the, the vignettes in their context. And so when you compare them to what happens in Philadelphia uh, after the text is added, there are some subtle changes that creep in. Um, and uh, again, with the obverse, not much. Um, there's very little that changes um, other than the addition of the text, Omnia uh, Relinquit Servare Republican. But the reverse is another story. Um, and, uh, uh, and this is Robert Scott, by the way. He's the future chief engraver of the Mint. He's been hired to do the text for the thing. And it looks like he, he, he does a little bit of meddling too, um, because uh, you can see he's added some detail to the tree stump. Um, he's tried to make sense of the plow, but it's still quite awkward. And then, especially down at the bottom, uh, it seems like he knows that these are supposed to be hands. And so he sort of suggests these little fingers. It almost looks like a, a squirrel holding an acorn now. It doesn't look like hands. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's really um, uh, Robert Scott that sort of, is one of the go-betweens in terms of the transmission of the design. And here's a uh, book frontispiece that he does a year later for the um, Society of the Cincinnati where he's brought two sides of the uh, diploma together 
and uh, and simplified the devices a great deal. But what it does show is that he clearly knows, as you see in the right there, that there are supposed to be hands uh, on the heart. Uh, so uh, it would seem that uh, that he's responsible for a lot of these changes. And if you compare now the engraved version to Brenner, um, you know there there are some differences, but they're they're uh, like I said earlier, few. Um, and here again, it makes a little more sense now what Brenner is looking at. He's trying to understand what this plow. Um, he seems to have added to the center of the shield, and he seems to have missed the point about the hands. Um, and so, and that's something that I want to come back to. Um, but he also uh, can't read this, and you can see it. It is hard to read. It says primium. He he has spelled it prium. Uh, so there, there's misspelling from there to here. So, you know, um, because Brenner's medals are rare and there's not a lot known about him, it's usually said that, you know, he created it on speculation as a way of showing his skill. And I, I really think this is unlikely because, um, as was earlier said, he, he really couldn't afford to work for free at any time. And, um, you know, he, 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 he rarely created works without commission. And when he did so, he did it, you know, with works that he hoped would have a popular market and then he advertised them and he signed them. So, you know, this, this medal looking nothing like Brenner's style with no name on it um, would be a very poor advertisement for Brenner's work. And I think, you know, he must have been asked to do it and he must, it must have been a commission. Um, and it, it you know, it had to have probably been uh, done by someone with an antiquarian interest who could give him access to the sources and who may have wanted an authentic, you know, original society medal uh, as a fantasy piece to fill a gap in, in history. Oops. Ugh. All right. Um, I missed a slide. Not sure how to. All right, good. Um, here we go. It need not have been a member of the Society of Cincinnati. I, I do want to say that these the the, the societies declined um, after about the first generation, and the family heirlooms and things like that start turning up in the marketplace. Um, these certificates, uh, you know, this one is a, in a numismatic sale from 1862, um, and you can see there on the right number 119. Um, and you know they're collectible, of course, because uh, you know they have the autographs of Henry Knox and and, and George Washington. On them. So anyone with an antiquarian interest in Americana this time. Uh, could possibly have had one of these certificates for, for, for Brenner to look at. And while these societies were in decline, when at the time Brenner arrives, they're, they're resurgent. Um, and this is, is a, a great quote. Um, it's um, Edwin Hoey, uh, in a, a, a little history he does in American Heritage of the, the Society of the Cincinnati, um, uh, says it perfectly. It's, it's, it, it's like, poetry. Uh, it says, dust settled in cobwebs formed in November 1854, the last original member of the society died. Uh, like a retired campaigner in the doze of his late years, the order slumbered, and then it was reawakened by the rising tide of immigration. As wave upon wave of hopeful foreigners rolled into the country, people began climbing their family trees to escape plebe the plebeian flood. The past became fashionable, especially if one's own family was involved and upsprang such organizations as the Sons of the American Revolution and its awesome counterpart, part, the Daughters. Uh, with its aristocratic beginnings and hereditary values, membership in the Cincinnati carried with it a set of impeccable social credentials. Grandsons and great-grandsons found themselves nudging the society's comatose body. Uh, during the 1880s and 1890s, it was revived and fitted out in a handsome new uniform. The old boy was back in business. And some of those grandsons and great-grandsons are, are, are members of the ANS, um, and uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, one of the main catalysts uh, of, of the sort of increase in profusion of these societies is the 1889 centennial of uh, Washington's inauguration, which takes place in New York. And you can see, I have on the screen, uh, you know, some of the dates of the earlier societies, and you can see by the 1840s, there are you know, only a couple of new ones, but in the 1880s, it starts to take off. Uh, and uh, the celebration of the um, centennial for Washington is uh, a massive spectacle. Uh, thousands of people participate. It takes three days. Uh, entire streets, buildings are, are decorated. There's parades, events. Uh, every day, the president comes up. 
Um, you know, and some of the parade floats are decorated like these with historic vignettes. And this one shows um, actually uh, the long room of Francis Tavern, uh, where Washington said farewell to his officers in, uh, in New York. And then uh, behind it, um, that was December 1783, behind it is the balcony of Federal Hall where he's taken the oath of office uh, in 1889. Two active participants in this uh, uh, spectacle uh, that Brenner will get to know, on which the, certainly Henry Russell Drown on the right is uh, associated with the ANS for quite a long time. Uh, I intentionally picked a picture of a youthful picture of him just because the one with the mutton chops will come later. Um, he's actually too young for 1889, but I wanted to use it anyway. Um, he's about 17. Um, and uh, the Drowns, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're very involved in the revival of heritage societies. Um, particularly the Sons of Revolution in the city of New York, um, but Henry Thayer Drown, uh, uh, his father, and you can see him wearing his Order of the Cincinnati in this uh, portrait, uh, is, 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 uh, rises quickly and uh, enthusiastically through their ranks. And by the time of the 1889 uh, inauguration, he is uh, one of the seven delegates sent by the Cincinnati uh, overall as, as their representative to attend every entertainment meal presentation and whatnot so he's he's pretty pretty deep in there so here's uh 1890 to 1897 i ran out of space on the slide uh, uh heritage societies uh that are formed uh beginning in, in the time that that brenner uh brenner arrives um, and I, I've been reading through these journals called The Spirit of 76, which are contemporary uh, to this period. Oh, this starts a few years later than this. And it reports on all the activities of the societies. And uh, Francis Tavern, uh, which is there on the right, that's what it looked like in the 90s, uh, is frequently a scene of their meetings and stuff. And the Sons of the American Revolution, which were founded during the Washington inauguration, were founded in the long room here. Uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution are founded here. Um, it's a it's a an important set, uh, destination for a lot of these groups as they, uh, you know, uh, have their activities and celebrate anniversaries and do their social gatherings and whatnot. Um, and uh, you know, in the um, spirit of seventy six, uh, the very first article is a history of the Cincinnati. Um, and the activities of many, many societies are covered. And uh, it, it, its editor is a man named William Brearley, who is a member of the New York Society of the Sons of the American Revolution. And he's married to a daughter of the American Revolution. So a lot of the coverage slants heavily towards the SAR and the DAR. Um, and, you know, th uh, there are some eventually some advantages to this. But what's interesting as well is uh, th there are in the letters to the editor, there is uh, a clear sense of the hostility that some of these people feel towards the, the wave of immigration and towards the people uh, who, are, who are becoming new Americans. And here's just two sample uh, quotes of that. Um, this uh, reverend from Rochester, New York uh, uh, says, another enemy dangerous to both church and state is the free and easy way in which it has become customary by law officials of both parties to grant the elective franchise to members of foreign governments by which he means immigrants. Uh, this country is big enough for all who wish to do so to come here and make it their home with us and become law-abiding citizens of the land, but it is not big enough for foreigners to come here simply to make money and occupy places which American-born citizens justly expect to occupy. An American-born citizen must stay here 21 years before he becomes entitled to use the ballot, but unscrupulous politicians are in great hurry to make citizens of people who are unworthy to hold the ballot in their hands or deposit in their vote, their vote in the ballot box. I denounce this as un-American, dangerous to the welfare of the American people. Seems like a nice guy. Um, September 97, this uh, slightly more uh, circumspect uh, quote, uh, but it's a good summary, you know, whether we believe it or not, feel it or not, think it or not, the many peculiar institutions of the American Republic are in constant danger. And there is need of positive action for maintain maintenance of those institutions that our patriot forefathers established in which we now enjoy. Uh, so it might seem unlikely uh, that a movement supported in a part by these kinds of sentiments could provide so many opportunities for a new American like Brenner, but it actually does. And even with different motivations, uh, their patriotism and hope for the future of the United States, uh, meaning they mean these societies and Brenner himself, uh, are entirely compatible. 
Um, in many ways, Brenner's own contributions and his own patriotism, uh, uh, which he will demonstrate, are, are evidence of their success. Uh, one patriotic body um, that um, the Patriot Club, which was founded in 1891, engaged in civic affairs with an emphasis on teaching patriotism to youth. And in the summer of 1895, they provided a program that was specifically for Russian Jews. Uh, and in their description of the program, uh, summarizing uh, the, the, the older students that are in one of these, uh, it's, a, it's a competition, uh, uh, history essay competition, uh, they say, the room filled with young men and women born and brought up in Russia and only a comparatively short time in this country. It was remarkable, the knowledge they displayed of our institutions, and all seemed to understand and appreciate the liberty enjoyed in the country of their adoption. Not many Native American young people could have made a better showing. Now, um, uh, you see Samuel Putnam Avery there on the screen as well, I and mean, you, you've heard about him earlier in uh, other presentations today. Uh, and it's entirely possible that, you know, Brenner or, or some of the younger members of this family might have participated in uh, programs like the, the one that I just described. Um, but it, it, you know, whether Brenner did or himself or not, um, he may have connected with this organization because of the involvement of Samuel Putnam Avery. And, um, and the fact is, he does connect with it. Um, Avery is a member from 1896 until his death in 1904. And uh, Brenner joins the Patriot Club in 1908. Um, and he, he, he becomes a, a member of the executive board for two years, 1908 to 1909, and he's even one of their annual speakers. And in fact, uh, in their seasonal program for 1908, 1909, he gave uh, a, another version of his talk, uh, you know, the art and craft of the medalist. So here's some samples of the kinds of things that you see in the spirit of 76. Uh, I got two issues here showing uh, Chauncey Depew um, uh, from the time of, of, of its founding and, and for about a decade, he's the president of the New York Sons of the American Revolution. Um, and eventually they're called the Empire State Sons of the American Revolution. And uh, I know uh, George Cahay is going to talk about him uh, a bit later, but he's he's literally everywhere in, in these things. And like I said, the, there is a bias towards the New York Sons of the American Revolution when it comes to how many inches of column inches of coverage they get. Um, this is actually uh, fortunate uh, for for. Brenner scholar, uh, scholarship because it, it allows for connections to be made with at least three of, of his, his early works. So in February 1895, the sixth issue of the Spirit of 76 is a lengthy illustrated description of their third annual banquet at the New York, uh, New York State Society of the Sons of the American Revolution. And as president, keynote speaker is Depew, and the front page illustrates him standing among the tables. You saw that a minute ago, uh, he's giving his oration, but then the text will go on to say, upon entering the banquet room, the members found at each plate an envelope containing a 30 page menu book in miniature form and dainty typography with a special badge reproduced in our second illustration, which was speedily displayed upon the left breast of the recipient. Now that's the Sons of the American Revolution, New York Sons of the American Re Revolution badge that Brenner was advertising in uh, the uh, um, the uh, jeweler circular and orological review. And, uh, and, and it, it appears in his ads, uh, just a, this is January and by May he's, he's, he's advertising it as his own work. Then, of course, it gives us a year. Uh, this is the um, Chauncey Depew medal that I know George will be talking about, so I'm not going to say any, anything more about it, except to say that this, this is a connection, potential connection uh, that, that Brenner may have to Depew a whole year before he, he does the medal. This is 95, that's 96. And then the third one, um, there's a later uh, uh, series of articles that they do where they're celebrating the successful biographies of their first thousand members. And uh, one of them is uh, Arthur Soper, who is the president of the Pinch Lighting Company. Uh, and, and so there's this, always, there, this is a late addition to Smedley's catalog of Smedley 121. Uh, seemed kind of like a strange piece, but it's basically a trade card. And uh, it, it's recreating the, um, the medal uh, that was done by Morgan and Barber for an 1883 uh, industrial uh, railroad exhibition where Pinch won uh, won the won the grand prize, um, and so uh, this gives you know a little more context uh, for for that piece as well. And then there's this. So in um, 
this is February 1895 issue, uh, there's this little note included in the report of the doings of the Sons of the American Revolution, and it reads, Mr. Bauman Belden, a member of the Sons of the American Revolution, read a paper upon the insignia of the Patriotic Hereditary Societies uh, of the United States. Uh, and he goes, he goes on to say it was at the ANS, and an AS, and it was going to be published. Um, and, you know, when he gives his report, he talks in great detail about, about six of the societies. And the first one is the Cincinnati, and he tells the story of the unrealized metal uh, that Linfont had designed. Um, and he goes into detail uh, about that. Uh, there are some of his ANS positions there, but also he was a member of the Pennsylvania Sons of the American Revolution. Another one uh, within the ANS, which we've already seen, is Andrew Zabriski. And um, as uh, we've already been told, he, he's responsible for, for Brenner uh, doing the, uh, uh, I should say Brenner's already a member of the ANS when Bauman Bolden gives that talk. Um, and um, Zabriski is president of the ANS. He's also a member of the Holland Society, the Society of the Colonial Wars, a Society of the World, uh, World War, uh, War of 1812, um, and eventually the St. Nicholas Society. Um, and, you know, the first medal, medal, medal Brenner does is one that he sponsors. And that's uh, shown there as the Muhlenberg Medal. And he's a trustee, he's a, a member of the executive committee for the hospital. Um, the other one uh, that can't be associated with the ANS, though, can be associated with Zabriski is the John Wakefield Francis Medal. Um, and uh, this is one of those examples where, you know, sometimes the explanation for something is, is hiding in plain sight, but, but how do you know? Um, if you look this up in Horatio Storer's Medicina in Numis, um, it's just described. Uh, but that was serialized in the American Journal of Numismatics uh, before it was published. And at the time he publishes it serially, he says that this metal uh, is very rare, only two are struck. He's wrong about that. Um, but he says that it's made at the behest of Andrew Zabriski, who had given him rubbings uh, 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 on paper uh, for his collection of medals. And by the time he publishes the book, he's got an actual medal in his hands. And so he just drops the whole story about Zabriski and stuff. It doesn't appear in the text anymore. And just to show very quickly the St. Nicholas uh, placket that Brenner does in 1912, it's much later, but you can see there's their insignia down at the bottom. Um, and this is just another, you know, He's no longer president of the ANS, but he's he's involved, and and you know obviously he knows Brenner, and he knows Brenner's work. In 1897, as Jesse mentioned, the ANS got into the sort of heritage uh, uh, spirit themselves and sent questionnaires around to all the members um, with uh, all kinds of uh, of interesting questions, like if uh, number 15 is if any biographical sketch of your his of you or your history of your family has been printed please refer to it number 17 if any of your ancestors or descendants have held important positions of honor please uh, or trust please give details uh number 18 if you can give the name of the first ancestor of the family of the family in this country please do so um and Bernard doesn't answer any of the questions really except for the ones of his name is his, his parents name his his one set of his grandparents uh, he mentions that he worked in Riga, but he does answer that last question. Uh, and I, I love it. Um, it, it. He basically says, myself, you know, being the first in this country landed May 17th, 1890. Um, it's just a terrific response to the question from a very confident uh, uh, new American. Uh, you know, he landed like the Mayflower. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great response. Um, but he's also, I think, at this point, pretty comfortably ensconced with, with the uh, folks in the ANS, many, many of whom uh, could fill out this application, in this questionnaire in triplicate. Um, and so I don't think he's really got anything to prove, uh, at least not at this moment. So uh, during and after Brenner's time in Paris, uh, he does numerous historical membership medals in connection with the ANS and its members. One of the members, as we've already learned, is Edward Dean Adams. Um, and Edward Dean Adams is the Sons of the Revolution uh, member, uh, just uh, uh, like uh, Henry Russell Drown. And he was also the founder of the Monmouth Historical Society. Um, and at Adams' request, Brenner creates a membership badge for the society. Um, and uh, the badge, when the, society, when the society was first founded, it operated like a heritage society and it was exclusive. And, uh, and, and so the membership badge uh, is worn like an order. And, uh, and, and, and many of them even have members' names engraved, engraved on them. 
And then of course there's the Vespucci. Uh, and then to the right is the John Paul Jones. And uh, the John Paul Jones is, uh, is important in this narrative because um, it, it was issued by the ANS to commemorate the return of Jones's remains to the United States. But um, that's an event that the New York uh, Sons of the Revolution had been trying to achieve uh, since 1895. And this is talked about in the, in the, um, the spirit of 76 uh, a couple of times. And then there's Daniel Parrish Jr. Um, who I looked, he seems to have been a member of none of the heritage societies and uh, even checking uh, uh, clubs in the social register where everybody lists all their heritage societies, it just has his address. Um, but he is uh, uh, it, it been very important roles in the historical society uh, in New York and in the American Numismatic Society, obviously. Um, and certainly he was gonna be involved in the production of their centennial medal um, in 1904, which, which Brenner does, which is the Pintard and, and Benson medal that you see there. Um, but what's really curious and, and, and important, I think, uh, well, as you'll see, is in 1898, he gives two of these Society of the Cincinnati medals uh, to the ANS. Um, doesn't say that they're by Brenner, uh, and, um, but if you look down here, uh, Zabriskie is giving uh, the Muhlenberg medal, and he do doesn't say it's by Brenner either. Um, so I'm not sure that means anything, but, um, but you know, from 1895, when Belden describes to his peers this medal that doesn't exist, to 1898, it suddenly does exist, and, and Parrish has two that he gives to the ANS. Um, so I, I do think that they're both involved, and obviously Parrish has some kind of direct involvement, but, um, but, but Brenner still needs a source. And that brings us back to the drowns. So uh, Henry Thayer Drown um, was uh, um, very, very, uh, he collected a lot of Cincinnatiana. And one of the things he did early on in his uh, membership of the Cincinnati was um, uh, the, they went looking for that plate that printed the diploma. And when it eventually, it wasn't found, um, but eventually they find it in 1890. And when they do, it's completely rusted beyond uh, function. And so uh, he hires his friend, uh, John Chester. I, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Um, I don't know if it's a, a tree or, or butter. He's Scottish, so it's, it's, it's not French, um, to uh, try to restore the, the, the plate. And um, Erskine Hume talks about this in his 1934 history of the diploma that he does uh, in the Americana Journal. And you can see here, uh, he's basically saying that uh, you know, dozens of proofs are made um, for drown um, that he passes on to his son, which which uh, Erskine Hume's able to see, and and I uh, I almost wonder um, I can't find an example that's printed from the restored plate. I haven't yet, anyway. If that's where the little hands go off the heart, and some of the other details change, uh, and that maybe Brenner was looking at one of these, and if if it is. Um, and it's, must, it's certain that the drowns were involved, but the fact is uh, they're also the only members of the Cincinnati. And when, when Henry Thayer dies in 1897, Henry Russell, his son, becomes uh, a member of the Cincinnati. And um, he's also, like I said, deeply involved in the Sons of the American Revolution, or Sons of Revolution in New York, um, and certainly responsible for this Medal of Brenner's, uh, which is the Talmadge Medal, uh, which is celebrating the restoration of the society um, when uh, uh, they buy it and move in as their headquarters and create a museum there. This, as, as I mentioned earlier, and you can see it looks very different now, is a sort of sacred place among the heritage societies. It's where Washington gives his farewell to the officers before he heads down to Annapolis to, to uh, surrender his commission to Congress and they're wintering in, in Annapolis that year. In 1919, he writes a booklet about the history of Francis Tavern, and, and uh, he quotes an 1854 description uh, by William J. Davis, uh, which I, is, is clearly important. He refers to this in the book as a shrine, um, and then he goes on to say, using this quote, the city of New York has made many futile attempts to erect uh, to the memory of Washington, a suitable monument, um, but it's already done. The preservation of Francis Tavern is the greatest monument that can be conceived or erected. Let the demagogue who would barter the liberties of his country for personal aggrandizement visit it and stand within that room where the greatest of men resigned his power and became a simple farmer again. So they believe that this is the place where, even though he doesn't, uh, sir, he, he's not really Cincinnati until he surrenders his commission, this is the place 
where that starts. So this is the sacred place where that happens. So in some ways, the Cincinnati medal um, that Brenner does is, is another sort of Francis Tavern medal. Um, they certainly connected and, and, and I think they're connected through Drown. So when the restoration of the tavern is complete and the museum is open, there's a great deal of historic material that's on display in the museum there. And I just underlined some things to show that there's a lot of personal material from Henry Russell Drown that's in this case. Um, old papers from his, his great grandfather and, and so forth. But what you also see are some of Brenner's works. There's the Talmadge Francis Tavern Medal that we just talked about. There's the Pintarga Benson Medal, which I uh, showed you with the Daniel Parrish slide, and, and then John Paul Jones Medal. And this is certainly, one of these John Paul Jones Medals is certain to be the one that Brenner did because um, it's the return of his remains uh, uh, to Annapolis and the, this organization, uh, the Sons of the Revolution, were actively involved in that. So, um, you know, I, I think what this also shows is that not only are Brenner's works of this type at this time uh, sort of a product of the colonial revival, but they're actually functionally advancing the the goals of the colonial revival and those goals aren't that different actually from 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 Brenner's own um you know it, it it's entirely consistent with his own goals uh, and later in his life he he reveals his interest in participating in U.S. history through his work when he tells Clara Whiteside from the Washington Herald quote I was glad when I had the opportunity to do the Lincoln Penny for it connected me with a part of American history which had in it great ideals as well as large achievement so I do think that the Society of Cincinnati Medal sits comfortably within Brenner's body of work because of all of these other things that he's doing and what he's participating in, even though stylistically it, 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 it has nothing really to do with, with, with the kind of medalist he's trying to be. Um, and he's, you know, it's, this is at a, a time when the ANS is actively collecting these insignia um, and eventually Brenner it helps them put them on display in Paris in 1900 because uh, he's there, um, and I think that was already mentioned. And, you know, all of these medals that I've been able to track down seem to have at one time or another also have passed through the hands of members of the uh, New York Numismatic Club, which I'll, I'll come to in a moment. Um, and yet somehow, uh, you know, so there's all these collectors that have them before 1934, and somehow Hume and the Society of Cincinnati know nothing about it. And, um, and I, I find that very telling. And I think that, you know, um, because it's Henry Russell Drown that tells him about it, and Henry Russell Drown can't quite remember uh, when it was made, but he believes it was Brenner, it, it may have been made for his father, uh, or his father may have been gifted one for helping Brenner produce the one that Parrish, the ones that Parrish gives to, to the ANS. Um, and this could explain, you know, why he doesn't remember it altogether and stuff like that. But one possible reason why the origin of the medal remains a mystery and may always be a mystery, uh, could be the tragedy that ends uh, Henry Russell Drown's death. And what happens to him is truly terrible. Um, and so um, just five days after his interviews with Erskine Hume, where he gives him information and stuff like that, um, he, he dies in a house fire. Um, and that's um, a piece of, of, well, it's not advanced. Oops, went too far. And it's big news. Um, and it's a really, it's, it's as you can see, um, uh, loss of everything. So, um, you know, the metal, um, the papers, and lots of things. And, and, and there, is a, there is a letter in the archives of the Society of the Cincinnati from his son, which makes reference to some things that he has in his possession. So perhaps it survived, but because he had multiple residences, um, but all the stories uh, uh, say the same thing. Um, which is that four people died in the fire and that all the collections were lost, including Rembrandts and, and, and Whistlers and things like that. And yet somehow uh, his little dog survives. So then the last part I just want to touch on are the medals themselves. Um, uh, again, I mentioned the New York Numismatic Club, uh, Thomas Elder, who's a member and also Sons of the American Revolution in Pennsylvania, uh, who, whose chapter, interestingly, was founded by uh, uh, William Spohn Baker. Um, he, he handles six of Brenner's medals uh, over uh, a, a short period of time. And, and I think in 1908, when the New York Numismatic Club is founded, um, that there, Elder alleges there are only 10 medals. 
and he's selling a whole bunch of Brenner material in this 1908 sale where he seems to have insight into all kinds of rarities and, and, and edition numbers and things like that, although he's not right about some of them. Um, he seems like this is a consignment from Brenner and that he's, he's you know, Brenner's a fellow member of the club. So um, I think at the beginning of the year, the ANS has two. I think Brenner has six. Uh, we know Drown has one. And so that would leave one unaccounted for. But Elder sells four in 1908 and then a silver and bronze example in 1914. And I think these are Brenner's exhibition copies because in 1912, uh, in the hollow show, he shows a, a silver one and a bronze one. And in the uh, IECM 1910 exhibition, he shows a silver one and a bronze one. Uh, but he only shows them, as far as I know, in those two in those two things. And then he doesn't show them again. And when the lit collection comes to the ANS, there are no Cincinnati medals in the collection, just a, a lead die trial. So here's the club. And just again to show how close knit these things can be. There's Elder. Here's Brenner himself. There's our Bauman Belden. Uh, looks like he has a picture on his head. Um, and I've added Henry Russell Drown and WWC Wilson because they also owned some of these medals. Um, and this is Wade Raymond. And Wade Raymond uh, will sell Wilson's medal in, in that famous sale, but he also has one in his own possession that uh, is privately sold by his estate to, to John Ford. So um, in, in this context, there this, this could be Brenner's exhibition pair because it's a it, he has a silver one, he has a bronze one, um, but you know the, the, they're certainly coming from elders' auctions and not because they were in any way involved in, in the creation of it. And then to end, I've got uh, the ones I'm currently tracking, trying to do a census, I hope, for this paper, and I hope that um, anyone if you if you have one, uh, you could let the ANS know or let me know, uh, and I'll make sure it's tracked. Or if you um, know somebody who has one, convince them. Um, but uh, you can see that um, you know there's the trial number one and number two. The, anything in the blue box is not collectible. Um, there's the ANS's material, and then there's Henry Russell Drown's piece. Um, but the rest of them are are out there. Um, number three is the John Ford uh, one that he got from Wait Raymond. Uh, that's in a private collection on the West Coast. Uh, number four was in a sale. Uh, Heritage sold that uh, uh, in 2019, and it had been on. It had appeared on eBay in 2016. Uh, number five, uh, well, that one sold this year uh, at a Kagan's auction. It was an entire collection of Brenner material sold in a single lot, um, which is now being broken up. Um, if you search, if you search the auction aggregators, you'll 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 find it. This one is on the market right now. It's going up for auction this month. Uh, and then uh, in the top right is a silver one, uh, the only silver one among them uh, that John Krelovich sold uh, a number of years ago. And it had a, a note with it about it uh, possibly being from the WWC Wilson sale. Um, so these are the ones I know about. Um, as I said, uh, it it's, could be there are only 10. Um, and, uh, and I'm interested, hopefully, by the time we publish this, to, to have a little bit more of a, of a census to share. Does anybody have any questions? I know it's a long-winded. Sorry. Uh, Patrick, uh, thank you so much. <coughs> Just remind me, how do we know it's by Brenner? He exhibited uh, as his own work uh, on two occasions. Um, at, at the International uh, um, you know, um, Exhibition of Contemporary Medals at the ANS in 1910, uh, he did show a silver and a bronze one, and, uh, and they are photographed, and they do appear in the catalog, uh, or among the, the photographs, um, the archival photographs of the the stuff that was on display, and then he does it again in the Hollow, uh, Arthur Hollow catalog. Is medal number seven in your census Wilson's? Um, let me scroll down. No, uh, that is um, uh, that is Drowns. Uh, so that that one is taken from. Uh, it's a great question. Thank you for asking. That is taken from uh, Erskine Hume's 
a catalog in the numismatist where he gave it the number 18 because he didn't know it wasn't an official medal and he didn't quite know what else to do with it um and i don't believe i think this photograph must be drowns because drown was telling him about it and it doesn't exactly match the ones at the ans i don't know if you can uh, uh, uh i mean if i can well there's a scratch in the in the, there's a scratch in it that you can see in the photograph that doesn't appear in the ans versions wilson's would have been the number six the one that john kralovich sold Uh, I have one, if no one else does. Patrick, I was wondering if there's any uh, sense that we know who made it. Um, this is circa 1896, you said, right? Is well, it's, that's a great question, Jesse. So Parrish gives the medals to the ANS uh, near the end of January in 1898. And, um, you know, I do think that maybe that his interest in trying to create the fantasy piece or whatever to fill the gap in their, uh, you know, insignia collection that they're building might have come from Bauman Belden in 1895. So somewhere between 1895 and 1898, this gets made, but it does look like um, Parrish's practice is to give things, when he's got one-offs that he's giving to the society, he seems to give them in a, a timely way. So uh, he, he gets, uh, in 1895, uh, gives a Society of the Colonial Wars medal to the ANS. Um, and it's only a few months after it was issued. Um, and I think he does the same thing with the Hudson Fulton one. Um, so there's a few instances where you can find that he seems to, I mean, he collects things and builds these great collections and then gives them a whole, but when he's giving these one-offs, he seems to do them as he gets them. So um, I think it's probably pretty fresh around 1897, um, because, but at the same time, uh, it is the, December 1897 is when Henry Thayer Drown dies. So um, that it's only six weeks after uh, Henry Thayer's death that it comes to the ANS. Um, I'm not sure if Brenner could have cut the dies in six weeks over, over the holidays and the rest of that. So I, I'm pretty sure it's the, the father that's involved and not the son. Um, but um, I, would, I would put it in 1897. Uh, Patrick, this is uh, Peter. I've got a... Uh, the question about the manufacture of the dye or, or the manufacture of the metal. Uh, do, do you know who Brenner used to strike the metals? And um, also, did Brenner have a, a manufacturer that he would typically use uh, to strike these? Um, because from what I've been able to determine, it seems that, uh, say, say in the case of the 1902 Prince Henry medal, that he was effectively in charge of the production of it, that he was overseeing you know, the production of the dyes and then uh, the actual striking and, and, and so forth. So did, did he have a, a manufacturer of mint that he typically used a preference for? He, he's, still working, he's still working for Robert Stoll in this period. Um, and Robert Stoll uh, does produce, um, can produce metals, uh, um, as you know, we've seen there are some uh, store cards and things, even his own ones. Um, and there are certainly other places that are within a block of, of that, um, that, you know, uh, where Brenner's own uh, studio is that produce produce these things. And, and, and so he, I, I think he would have had it made by one of the commercial jewelers, um, and not necessarily an art uh, engraver if he was doing it on his own. But um it's hard to tell because there's no there's so many of them and they they often are producing the same things i don't know if that answers your question but i, I he is working for robert stoll until he leaves for paris so um he certainly had access to to that operation um you know from 95 to to, to, to certainly the end of 97. thank you for watching the american numismatic society's youtube channel don't forget to subscribe and if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.